Hi, I'm Tom. This is Greg from Little Wars TV. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, a game that's come out. It came out at the end of 2018. It's Mark Herman's Gettysburg. And it's a, it's a nice, quick play game, 60 to 90 minutes once you learn the rules. Uh, written by Mark Herman, as I indicated. Published in C3i Magazine, their 2018 fall edition, uh, which retails now for around $45 on Amazon. Hopefully by now you've seen our uh, Gettysburg War Game that we put together in collaboration with the American Battlefield Trust. If you haven't, you should definitely watch that episode. But we're hoping maybe that episode inspired you to do some Gettysburg gaming. And uh, that's part of what we're talking about here. We're gonna, that's right. We're going to review a, a whole series of uh, quick, easy to get into board games uh, that you could play that don't involve painting thousands of miniatures. So if you're interested in trying the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, we're hoping to give you a couple of options. When you're buying C3i Magazine, you're getting a number of things. So in that particular issue, you've got two games, a Napoleonic 1815 and this Mark Herman uh, game. And besides that, you get a lot of other things. So I think, uh, I think it's, it's reasonable for what, what you pay. Uh, the author, uh, it's Mark Herman, as we've indicated. Uh, Mark is well known. His Empire of the Sun is probably the one that's on everybody's mind most of the time these days. Sure, but he's got lots of other right. classic. Washington's War. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah Mark is, uh, doesn't need a lot of introduction, but I think this was one he always wanted to do, something to do with Gettysburg, mm -hmm. uh, and he finally did it. Uh, what you get again is the map. Uh, a nice, really great design, very clear where the key terrain and the road networks are. And that key terrain does matter, doesn't it? Clint? It does. When, <laughs> uh, in our next section, when we talk about how to play the game, I think we'll be mentioning that. But yes, it definitely matters. Definitely around 20 chits to the game. You're looking at uh, key commanders, Lee and Meade, and then you've got a chit for each Union Corps and for Confederate divisions. Yeah, I will say, having played the game, it was far fewer pieces than I expected. <laughs> right. But it turns out it's it's really everything that you need to get a sense of the Battle of Gettysburg. I thought it was a really, uh, really elegant design. But there were a couple of, of course, pages in the magazine itself that, that go into detail about the rules. That's right. So uh, you're going to need more than the player aid summary. But you're right. I mean, basically, uh, once you've read the rules, a couple of pages, yep. uh, this summary sheet will, will pretty much do it for you. All right, so next, now that you know what you get when you buy this game, let's talk about how you actually play the game, starting with the setup. Start with a typical first day setup, uh, and there you're going to have some predetermined location for some name uh, units, like uh, Pleasanton, Buford, outside of Gettysburg, and Heath coming in the Chambersburg Pike. Uh, and then you'll start to feed those in according to a reinforcement schedule. Yeah, I mean, if you know anything about the Battle of Gettysburg, you know at the beginning there's really not that much right. at the battle, and that is the case in this game. There are very few chits that are on here, and the entire game is only six turns. That's right. It's a morning and an afternoon of three days, so a six-turn game. So there's not a lot of pieces, there's not a lot of turns, but the setup is certainly very easy. It is easy, and, and as we saw uh, playing through it recently, it's, uh, it's really challenging in the trade-off between uh, your march moves, which are fairly quick. Uh, so if you're in a march column coming onto the field of battle, and you're outside of a zone of influence, which would be two hexes out, uh, you can move pretty rapidly and repeatedly. There's, of course, two sides to every chit, and you would think flipping over a chit, you know, in a lot of games is casualties. But in this game, it's not. Mm -hmm. The combat effectiveness of the unit is represented uh, by, if they have bonuses, there's a couple of stars on the chit, maybe up to two. And the real number that you have to pay attention to, the only number on the chit, is the movement rate. Right. So on the front side of the chit, you'll have what's probably a four for infantry. You can move four hexes in march. And you flip the chit over to the back side, not when you've suffered casualties, but when you come within proximity of the enemy. Right. And there you've got a number one. You can only move one hex once you've come within proximity of the enemy. That's right. So the process is a lot of quick marches uh, to get into the neighborhood of an enemy unit, and then uh, both sides will have a chance to adjust their attack uh, hex by hex. So it's, a, it's an interesting play there where you everybody kind of moves very rapidly and then you have some final adjustments for combat. Yeah, it's, it's the usual alternating of moves. You know, I move a chit, you move a chit, we go back and forth. But uh, as you mentioned, you can move a chit multiple times. That's key. As, as long as you're eligible to move, you can keep 
coming back when it's your turn and the same chit can sort of fly across the map and you and I saw a lot of that happening. That's right. And I, I love the idea that the, the, the mechanic that Mark has in this game for how a turn ends. You know, a, a turn ends when your chits are basically locked down. Right. When you've come within one or two hexes of the enemy, you've lost your ability to do that march rate, your choices suddenly dwindle, and now the turn is just going to kind of come to a conclusion. Or, of course, you can pass. That's, and that's a very interesting strategic yeah. decision in this game, isn't it? I agree. The passing is, is critical. I mean, you really have to figure that out because it's a, partly it's around when you're in a position where you're able to pass, you know the other player is going to get a random number of moves. Right. Influenced by how many units they have that are kind of free-floating out there outside of zone of influence. They'll add a dice roll to it. But it's, there's times when you clearly think it's in your best interest to stop Right. pass and take your chances that they'll probably only be able to move a number of units up closer to the battle and maybe not get into the battle. Right. But I, I, I do like that sort of gambling mechanic where yeah. you're really taking your chances if you want to pass. But uh, I think that that pretty well covers the, the movement part of the game. Uh, the combat part of the game is even easier than the movement part yeah. of the game. It's still fun. <laughs> it's fun, but you roll 1d6. Yeah. You know, each side rolls 1d6, and there are only a couple of modifiers to that. One of them we already mentioned was if your chit has any stars on it for mm -hmm. being a particularly good combat unit. You know, Reynolds in the first core, for example, yep. they've got a combat bonus. Hood's division, as you Absolutely. might expect, has one as well. Yep. Uh, but other than that, really, the only other major... Uh, question is, do you have unengaged chits that are within one hex to support, and the high ground that we talked about? That's right. The high ground is, is critical. It's it, huge. It, it felt very good. I mean, accurate to the... It's plus or minus two. That's right. Plus or minus two on a D6 game is, I mean, it really does dictate your battle plan tremendously, as it yeah. should at the Battle of Gettysburg. The only other factor you could throw in to mitigate that would be artillery support. I love the way he handles artillery yeah, support. I do too. That uh, I think we left some on the table last time. We, we did. Came. We did. Uh, but it was, it was, you were always managing that, is this the right situation? There are no chits. Artillery? There are no pieces for artillery support. Uh, it's just a chart at the bottom of the map that we'll show you, and each side gets a certain number of artillery points that you're sort of just guaranteed to have. Yeah. The Union has more than the Confederates, as you'd expect. Uh, and you just decide at each battle, am I going to invest my artillery in this or not? But it's a dwindling resource, so you really do have to conserve it for the yeah. most important engagements. You've got to decide if you want to spend it, and then you know, there's a little roll-off to see who actually gets to apply their bonus. That's so, right. Only one person will get it. That's right. So sometimes it's wasted, but uh, it's always early on you're you're thinking about husbanding that right. resource. <laughs> yes. And then as we found, you there, you get to this middle part where you're throwing it in fairly frequently. That's right. Uh, and you're always waiting for when's Pickett's charge coming that I really need this stuff. Uh, but I love the way that plays. It keeps, uh, keeps the map clean. Yes, it does. You don't have a lot of extra chits moving around and it really makes you uh, make that call of when you think it's essential. Speaking of extra chits, um, people might be wondering about leaders, because I know you mentioned that Lee and Mead are in this game. They're the only two command chits that you'll find. They don't function in any battle capacity. You actually don't fight with them. They can't die. It's not like right. somebody's chit's going to come and, and capture them. It's really just for uh, the um, uh, command distance. A certain number of hexes. Lee has eight. Mead has six that they need to be within that distance. and uh, right. I like that. I, I mean, it's, I think as he has expressed it, it's, their, it's your command intent. Right. So you often find Lee, who's attacking, being placed somewhat inside the Union uh, lines, right. because that's where you want your units to end up in, in uh, range at the end of the movement. I found, as, as the Confederate player in our first game, that it was really difficult, actually, in the end of the game, because you've got, of course, your units spread all over the map, and even though it's a small map, eight hexes doesn't cover the whole map. Right. Uh, so it does limit your ability to, to make offensive moves, which, again, I think is a, a very simple clean way to get it done. So let's talk about the end game. Uh, how do you actually win the game? As you eliminate units from combat in the first two days, uh, they will they have a chance of coming back. Uh, at least two on every, you would come back essentially 24 hours later. Right. Um, and you could bring on up to two at that point. 
and they come back in some range of the headquarters. But on the third day, hmm. those units don't come back, they're eliminated. And so that's where you start to see a point differential possibility. And that's so the scoring would be the Confederate wins if they have the greater number of eliminated units. Correct. Or they've eliminated the greater number of units. Yep. Uh, the Union wins on ties. Right. Uh, or if the Confederates control one of the roads uh, passing from the Chambersburg, Chambersburg Pike through town and out either the Baltimore Pike. Right. There are three possible roads, right. all, of course, deep behind Union lines. Right. So those, those town. are difficult victory conditions. Exactly. But, that's, but that's it. You know, either the Confederates take one of those key roads to Washington or they destroy more Union units uh, than they have lost Confederate units. Those are the only victory conditions. That's right. That's right. So that actually brings up a unit in our in our battle. Uh, I because I, I saw this online. Somebody was mentioning the uh, the Burden Sharpshooters, right? Yes. That's a that's a special unit. It doesn't take up. It doesn't function as a chit itself, but it, it exerts a zone of control, and so that can be very useful in either enhancing your combat uh, capability to, at a particular battle, or in that final effort by the Confederates to control the road network. You, they should not be forgotten. Right, area denial. <laughs> they could certainly be helpful there. But uh, I think all of that ties together in a really elegant uh, little game, which I enjoyed very much. I, yes, I, I would strongly recommend it. All right, so now we're going to come to the end of our review, our last category, and we're going to ask whether or not we think you should buy a copy of Mark Herman's Gettysburg in C3i magazine. And, uh, well, you already bought it. I did. <laughs> so, Sight unseen. <laughs> any regrets? <laughs> uh, no, this is actually the, uh, this is a real treasure. I would, I, I hope people are able to get a hold of it uh, through C3i. Um, it really is a fun game, and it's a great, it says 14 and up. Uh, I have no doubt you can play with the variety of people who, might be hard to talk into a war game, right? But if they know anything about Gettysburg, uh, this will give a great feel and might be a great introduction to them as well. Yeah, it, you know what? It's so weird. It occupies that great space between a perfect introductory game mm -hmm. for someone who's not a war gamer, like you said, right? Or you know, you and I are both veteran war gamers, and we had a great time. Oh yeah, and I yeah, absolutely. So I think that there's something here for everybody. There's a lot of tactical nuance in what looks on the surface to be a very simple game. Yes, it does. Um, but I think that there is a ton of replay value in this. Absolutely. So, oh, I'm, I'm dying to go again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> either on the same side or switching sides. Flip, flipping was probably appropriate. Yeah, but, uh, so if we're doing our sort of final review of this, I would say that the, the, the quality of the pieces certainly is what you would expect from a C3i game. Yep. Uh, they're, they're, they're very nice. Uh, the rules are short and very clear. Absolutely. I mean, within 20 minutes, we were set up and playing the game. Uh, and the pace of play is very good. It says you can finish a game to 60 and 90 minutes, and in our first game, we were done in less than 90 minutes, and I bet you in our second game, it'll be less than 60. I agree. Yeah, I actually envisioned this, as I mentioned at the time, This is you could picture this as speed chess in the park, but uh, yes. Gettysburg, meaning once you know the rules, it's easy to flip through it and play a couple games in a setting, which I think is always a great, great way to have an evening of gaming. All right, so now that you've heard what Tom and I think of Mark Herman's Gettysburg game, uh, we'd love you to know that we plan to continue looking at some more Gettysburg games. You know, this is the 156th anniversary this year of the Battle of Gettysburg. So what are we going to take a look at next? Well, the next one, which uh, we're going to take a look at, is the Pub Battles Gettysburg Edition, which is a, a, more of a, a little bit more of a Kriegspiel style. A beautiful map, wooden blocks, and uh, it, uh, I think you'll really enjoy our playthrough and review of that. Another very simple game, but completely different in almost every way from this game. <laughs> Have you played this latest Mark Herman game, Gettysburg? If so, we'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Uh, please let us know your thoughts. And if you can think of some other great introductory level Gettysburg board games uh, to recommend for new players, please mention those in the comments as well. We are always looking for new games to try.